Is adultery wrong? So staying on the adultery track, Exodus 2014 says you shall not commit adultery. It's pretty clear. But Numbers 31:18 says, but spare for yourselves every girl who has never had relations with the man. This is um, Moses talking to the Israelites when they're going and attacking the Moabites. And he says, kill the men, but spare for yourselves every girl who has never had relations with the man. So it seems pretty gross. Hosea 1 and Hosea 3 also say, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, he told him, Go, take a prostitute as your wife and have children of adultery, because this land is flagrantly prostituting itself by departing from the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though, though they turn to other gods and offer raisin cakes to idols. So on the one hand, Moses seems to be telling people to go and commit adultery. And on the other hand, God seems to be telling people to go and commit adultery, even though God already told us not to do that. So what's going on here? This is kind of a tough one, but I think there's some good research behind it that shows that these are not actually contradictions. Mm -hmm. But go ahead. What are your thoughts? Well, I saw a couple different things that were brought up, you know, some some uh kind of zeroed in on on the term prostitute um mm -hmm. you know was she just you know maybe she wasn't like how we would understand a prostitute today uh she was just um sleeping around i guess um but not necessarily for money um i also saw where um and it may have been in the text that she was she was a married woman Mm. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, to me, on, you know, on, looking at it on the face, yeah, that's something's, something's not right here. You know, why, why is it not okay? And then all of a sudden he's encouraging his, you know, he's encouraging him to, to do something that's not okay. But the thing that it, I kind of draw back to is, um, Abraham, um sacrificing Isaac you know killing killing an innocent person or um maybe not innocent maybe that's not the right word but um because we've all sinned so we're all you know we all fall short but you know just executing your 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 children um mm -hmm. is not and you know that's that's murder so you know, right. murder, murder is wrong. So why, why is God telling him to, to murder his son? But it, it's, but it's drawing us, it's making a bigger, um, it's, it's making a bigger picture. It's, it's yes. not about, it wasn't about him killing his son, just like this isn't really about, you know, go do this thing I said not to do in every other case, but in this case, you can do it. it he's making the connection of how, Israel as a nation was prostituting itself and mm -hmm. had become disloyal to God. To me, it just seems right. like he, he's making a, he's making a bigger picture, I guess. Yeah. There's a bigger point to be made. Um, but I think as far as the claim of there being a contradiction goes, you can still show that these are not contradictions and you don't have to just rely on, Oh, well, we don't really know, but he's making a bigger picture, even though I would say that's good. Um, it's not the whole story. So mm -hmm. here's what I got. Well, first of all, there's two different objections here. One is about Numbers 31 and one is about Hosea. So we have to kind of do them separately. So in Numbers 31, God seems to be saying through Moses to abduct young virgins and do whatever you want with them, right? But there's two possible solutions to this. The first one's pretty simple. And I'm not really partial to this one. But it says, this passage represents Moses trying to speak for God, but telling the Israelites to do sinful things. So it is Moses talking here. He's claiming to speak the word of the Lord, but maybe he tells people to do things that are sinful. Moses obviously was not perfect. Um, he spoke for God, and he communed with God, and he saw God face to face, but he also was a sinner. So this could be an example of something where he told them to do something wrong, um, saying that it was from God, but it's really not. Again, I'm not really partial to that answer, but it is a possibility. Um, the second 
possibility kind of requires some context. So we need to know what's going on with, with the Moabites and all that kind of stuff. Um, God declared that the inhabitants of the land, um, this being the land around the Israelites, needed to be killed and wiped out because they had repeatedly rejected God and worshipped idols. And we know that's true from the history of the Bible in the Old Testament. Um, Israel is set apart as sacred for God, sanctified for the Lord, and all the other nations are cast aside because they continually um, commit <clears throat> adultery with other gods, um, you know, worshiping idols and all that kind of stuff. Um, often these rituals required sexual immorality, and especially in the case of Moab, it actually talks about that. So the girls who had never been with a man were actually innocent of the sin of their region. So if you read earlier in Numbers, the Moabite women were enticing the Moabite, or sorry, not the Moabite men, they were enticing the Israelite men to come and commit sexual sin with them in adultery as a, a part of their worship to their idols. And so in, telling, in God telling these people to go and wipe out the evil in the region, he's actually sparing the people who had not committed that sin. They couldn't have done because they were virgins, right? They didn't commit sexual adultery. Um, yeah, they were innocent of the sin of their region and thus not deserving of death. Um, that's why, well, the men were just a casualty of war, right? So the men were to be killed, but the women who had committed adultery were also to be killed, just not the virgins. Um, these girls also were described later on as women in Numbers 31-35, and so were therefore probably not considered young, like, children, right? They'd be considered of a legal age. These con I want to say real quick, these conversations are really tough because this kind of language is so charged nowadays that I could see people accusing me or you or someone else talking about this as being, like, someone who supports sexual immorality. Um, just because we're trying to defend a passage of scripture that people disagree with. Um, I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to be as uh, forgiving as I can to the language used here because I'm not trying to be as charged uh, with the language as people are nowadays. So when it says, take for yourselves every young girl who has never had relations with a man, but then it also later says that these were women and numbers them along the, alongside the Israelites, I'm not going to look at this in bad faith and say, spare for yourselves every young girl or every girl means like children. So anyway, uh, Deuteronomy 21 also indicates that captives taken from another land should not be sold for money or mistreated, which forbids abduction and sexual immorality. So if we have these Jews who are trying to follow God to their utmost, um, Though they sin at times, right, they're still the people who try to follow God and they're led by the priest, they're led by Moses, all that kind of stuff. They are people who are of God and they listen to his commandments. Well, one of the commandments was if you take people from another land via through war, if you take prisoners or whatever, they should not be sold for money, meaning they should not be sold into slavery, or they should not be mistreated. So the view of Numbers 31 from the critics is already forbidden in Scripture. Deuteronomy 21 says you can't do that. So we have to look through the lens of Deuteronomy 21 and see Numbers 31 and say, well, then this can't be about some kind of immorality because it's already something that has been forbidden by God, and this is also God speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the Bible also says that God does not change you know, he doesn't contradict himself. Uh, yeah, these were women meant to be taken as wives, not slaves. And lastly, the women, as prescribed in Deuteronomy 21, were to be made wives. Oh, I just said that. They were not to be taken in an adulterous manner. Um, it may be in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 21, maybe somewhere else, where it's talking about... Um, the conduct that you're supposed to have with these women that you take as your wives. And it's very forgiving um, to the women. It's like, you don't mistreat them. If the marriage doesn't work out, then you divorce them and you don't just leave them for dead, right? But you let them go free. Um, you're not to be treating them terribly. You're not to be selling them for money. 
they're meant to be well taken care of and treated as wives just like any other woman would be treated as a wife. And when you look at those, by the way, you also have to look at the scriptures that talk about the conduct of men to their wives and what they're supposed to do with them or to them in the Bible. Those also are passages that talk about treating women correctly, um, providing for them. Even in the case of men who had multiple wives that weren't supposed to favor one over the other, things like that. So God makes provisions for these women to be well treated by the men, even though their nation around them is something that is being destroyed on behalf of God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I just dumped a whole lot on you, but <laughs> yeah. Long story short, the women that were taken here were not a part of the sin of their region, so they were not to be killed. God also tells the Israelites to treat well the people that are taken as captives and to take these women as wives and to treat wives well. So none of this, if looked at through the lens of the rest of the Old Testament, should be looking, should be seen as them oppressing or committing adultery with these women. Right. Well, good point. Good point. <laughs> um, and I, and, and it just, something just popped in my head too, that I, I, I'd like to add add to it. Sure. Um, so it could also be seen as an act of mercy. So at that in that time period, let's say that the woman what let's say that it was some type of unlawful divorce. Um, mm -hmm. um you know, in God's eyes, like that the bond of marriage is is um you know, for forever, you know? Um, so let's say that, that this woman, um, let's say that the man abandoned his wife for, you know, for, for, you know, for whatever reason, this mm -hmm. woman is now on her own, which was not a good position for a woman of that time period to be in. Um, no. and, 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 and in some cases it, it led to a life, um, like as they describe her here as, you know, um, as a prostitute. So, um, that, you know, for him to be told to go take, to take this woman as his wife could also be seen as, you know, is the adultery that he's committing because he's with a woman that was previously married. Mm. And then, and, and, and he would be kind of taking her out of the situation that she's in. Um, do you see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? That, it's, yes. that, it, that it would be more of an act of mercy to, to, to like rescue this woman from, from the life that she's, that she's in. Yes. And I think that's true. I'm just going to add some stuff to it. So in Hosea, it seems to be that God is telling him to go marry a prostitute. And we already know from the Bible in Leviticus 21 that it's forbidden for men to marry a prostitute, right? Well, not exactly. Um, only the high priest is forbidden from marrying a prostitute. We're not talking about committing adultery right now. We're just talking about marrying a prostitute. Only the high priest is forbidden from doing that. So it says, the high priest must not marry a widow, a divorced woman, or a woman defiled by prostitution, but only a virgin from his own people, so that he will not defile his offspring among his people. I am the Lord who makes him holy. Right, so this rule didn't apply to Hosea because he's not, probably not, the high priest. Um, therefore, he could take a prostitute as a wife, and to your point, he could redeem her. Mm. There's this whole thing in the Old Testament about redemption. Kinsmen redeemers were, if a woman's husband died, the brother of the husband would, or a relative of the husband would take her as a wife in order to redeem her, to provide for her and whatever. Um, this is the kind of same, kind of the same thing going on, except that they're not any kind of relative. Mm -hmm. He is able to bring her out of prostitution and redeem her, make her a wife, not a prostitute, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's exactly what you said a second ago. Also, 
the children are called children of adultery, not because Hosea is committing adultery by having children with this woman, because remember, we've already said that he can take her as a wife and redeem her. They are called children of adultery simply because they come from someone who previously committed adultery. Mm -hmm. That's that's all it needs to say. Right. They're children of an adulterer. Yes, she's an adulterer, mm -hmm. but they are not conceived in adultery. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, and that cha that changes the whole that whole that changes the whole narrative. You know. Mm -hmm. it, it makes it where it's like, well, God's telling them to do something bad. And then it's like, oh, no, wait, what it could be something that's actually really beautiful. Yeah, exactly. In a weird kind of way. <laughs> and also consistent with the rest of the Bible. Right. Where God is constantly redeeming people and telling people to go redeem people. Right. And the whole story of the Old Testament is that the nation of Israel and the entire rest of the world can be redeemed through Jesus through the Messiah, right? So you have right. this overarching theme of redemption. This is just one of those pieces that slots into that. Which goes That's back why. to, it goes back to the pain in the bigger picture too, that yeah. he had to, he had to send mm -hmm. a redeemer to it, the nation of Israel who was cheating on God with other gods to lift them up out of the situation that they found themselves in. Exactly. Yep. All right. There's a couple more comments that I have here. One is just kind of a funny side comment. I just, I think it's kind of funny that um, the wife's name is Gomer because it makes me think of Gomer Pyle. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, Hosea is told to make her his wife. So the children are not a children of adultery because she's not in adultery anymore. So they're not children of adultery on account of Hosea. This is a description of the origin of the children, not a prescription for Hosea to commit adultery. Description and prescription is something that everybody needs to know that needs to know the difference between. Prescribing something is God telling us, go do this. Mm -hmm. Describing something is God or someone else saying, this is what happened. Right. So this is a description, not a prescription. Okay. It's also suggested that Gomer later on cheated on Hosea with another man. And therefore, the command by God in Hosea 3 is a command to take his wife back and redeem her again from the sins that she had committed. Neither of these are commands for Hosea to directly commit adultery. So if we go back to Hosea 3, it says, uh, Then the Lord said to me, Go show love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. So she's loved by another, that means perhaps she went back to her old ways and committed adultery against Hosea with another man. But God says, go and redeem her again. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and offer raisin cakes to idols. Uh, the Israelites never did that just once, right? They did that tons and tons of times. But God kept coming back to them. So in the same way, he's telling Hosea, go and redeem her again even though she committed adultery on you again. Mm -hmm. You have the right to divorce her based on the Old Testament law, but go and redeem her mm -hmm. because through your actions, I'm going to demonstrate how much I love Israel. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a parallel. Right. And to your point again, he's painting a bigger picture here. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting. So like, if so a critic would would find this and go aha look at this but if they looked into it they'd go oh wow that's really cool yeah we'd hope so we'd hope they would all right yeah that one's a favorite of mine just because the explanation explanation of it doesn't try to couch it or go we don't know but maybe it's like this it's like no, the answer to it actually flips it exactly on its head. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly opposite what people think when they originally read it. And it's a really beautiful piece of the overall story of the Old Testament. It's wonderful.